occasions where I was saying like watch what you're going to do tonight and said don't take too much drugs and the next morning I was in a probation place I woke up the next morning with, with that that new friend on a stretcher with, with him dead and I never forget his face seeing him seeing his face dead it was the first dead body I've ever seen and he OD'd basically in the bed that night I think he took an awful lot of them drugs that morning when he woke up knowing that he was out of prison back to square one the only thing he could do but to deal with these feelings was to take drugs again. That's the only explanation I can think, you know. I grew up in a town in Tipperary called Carrigan Shore. While I was growing up as a child, there wasn't very much work in my town. The last man's factory in that town basically closed down about five years previous. Everybody had to travel really far to work and, and get there and get back. A lot of people started moving out of the town and then since there was no work inside the town, not people hadn't got money. I think it attracted the drugs towards the town in that kind of sense where it could make money. My father was a, a manager and he was a football trainer and, le and an athletics coach. So it was always in my family to be, to be sporty and to be active. But once I hit the age of 11, 12, 13, I got introduced to drugs. And when I got introduced to drugs, it took my will for playing sports and my activities went. Slowly but surely. I found there was nobody else inside my team that would have been taking drugs like me and training with them. But I felt like that to make me normal to go training, I had to take these drugs, you know. And as I ran around and I played football, I could feel a hindrance while I was playing it even then. I could feel it was hindering what I was trying to accomplish and achieve in the football by staying very, very fit and that. I noticed after a while when I was doing pre-season training that I was finding it very hard. Then uh, I would have been putting me getting sick and doing things like that. And my manager and my father at the time would have been very uh, tuned into that and asking me, well, why are you getting sick? And they would have noticed me not looking too well and they're asking me, am I OK? And the group that they would have thought I'd been hanging around with wouldn't have been the group that I was hanging around with. I would have had a couple of groups of friends, ones that would have been involved in sports, ones that would have been really involved in music and ones then that were just totally involved in drugs. As I kind of moved from the music group and the the athletes kind of, the, the group of people who sang around with, like I started getting more dragged into the drug kind of scene. I first OD'd when I was 13 years of age. I was very, very bad in hospital. I was in there. I was life, life threatening with the amount of drugs that I took. I wasn't physically able to walk for two weeks after the amount of drugs I took. I was basically isolated to a bed. And I couldn't get up. I was in a wheelchair then for a long time after. I was really that bad. I had no energy at all inside me. And basically, I got out of the hospital. Uh, I had straight away. I had good intentions, never going back down that road again. And uh, choose my friends again, and choose the ones that were involved in music all the time. I love music as well, and I love playing music and things like that. So I got involved with the lads again, and we started playing, playing our guitars and our drums and our singing and. Try to try to be what pop stars are, you know. And uh, as it went on, about a week down the line after that, a few friends popped up again, and and I ended up going back down through the housing estate with them. I went down there and I met into a fella. I was 13 at the time. There was this young fella was about between 16 and 17, 
and basically suggested looking at this house and basically sizing it up what we were, how we were going to get in there. We basically jumped the back wall, uh, put a big pole through your man's back door and ransacked the whole house. Took everything out, jewellery, televisions, all the computers, the computer games, all this kind of thing that was worth money to us and we took it away down to the end of the state. I was down there about three hours selling jewellery and selling all different types of equipment to get money up for drugs. Thinking nobody knows, went back up to my house and as I entered the door of my house, the guard uh, surrounded me and took me into a car, got my father to come down to the guard station because I was underage and uh, started questioning me about it. I straight away trying to be the hard man, denied everything and refused the statement completely, blank point blank. Little did I know that the fella that was 16, 17 years of age that was as a kind of putting us up to this was in there telling the guards exactly what was out there happening. And the main fear of what was going to happen to me was denying it. He ended up, obviously because he, because he owned up to it, he, he got let go. And I got a JLO. From then on, I, uh, I just started taking ecstasy more frequently and started taking speed more frequently. I would have been taking drugs and I would have been drinking during school hours. I went in and started my junior cert exam and I was actually intoxicated, full of alcohol. Still to this day, I don't know how I passed them, but it was, it was probably by fluke, I'd say, that I passed it. I couldn't even remember writing on the paper. But that's how much control the drugs had on me. It came to the stage where I was, I was on a rampage, basically, I would call it, for a number of years. I was robbing and I was hurting people and I was taking as much drugs as I could just to stay out and stay alive. That was my life. So as life went on, I ended up getting mixed up with the wrong crowd, really the wrong crowd. I ended up through the courts in prison up in Dublin because we hadn't got the, the means down to Bray to keep me down there and keep me safe. Even from before I got locked up into prison, uh, I could only see my mother and my sister, my father didn't want to have anything to do with me because of the things that I was doing and the shame that he had on him for the stuff that I was doing because it was so, so much of a close-knit community that if someone done something wrong, it was a big thing. So I really blackened their name as such and my brother did it as well, I suppose, uh, in the sense that he didn't want to have anything to do with us. So when I got locked up into prison, I had basically no visits. My mother wouldn't come up, my father wouldn't come up, and my sister, I wouldn't have liked her to be seen in a prison either anyway. So I basically had nobody. It was a terrifying experience for the first first couple of weeks, you know. And uh, But once I got used to it, I knew that I'd be able to cope with it, you know. Well, Vincent was in uh, Cloverhill Prison and I got a... Uh uh, a phone call from the governor just to say that if Vincent had somewhere to go he would be released for a few days at Christmas time on temporary release. So we said okay we would take him into one of our hostels for the, the few days. So Vincent came to us for a few days over Christmas. Uh, he seemed to settle into the place very easily and certainly we had no difficulties with him being there. So when he was released, uh, we took him back into the, the hostel. And we got to know him and Vincent was making great uh, progress in his own personal life and his own personal development. So after a period of time, we uh, gave Vincent a job working with other younger uh, drug users who were coming up. And uh, Vincent was su suitably qualified. He had been there where they are now. He had been through it all. He knew what the score was. Uh, he knew the difficulties of, of coming off drugs, so he was actually excellent at, at working with other young people uh, who were in the situation that he had been in several years previously. He also was a great role model with them and had great credibility with them because if I talk to them about drugs, they say, well, you know nothing, you were never on drugs. But when Vincent talks to them about drugs, they respect what he's saying because he's been there, done that, and he has been where they are now. So they listen to him in a way that they don't listen to social workers or, or uh, counsellors uh, who they would say, you, you, don't know, you don't know what we're going through because you've never done it yourself.